when the settlers were first arriving in America and starting their inroads inland, a squirrel could have run from the east coast, the shore of the east coast, all the way to the Mississippi River without ever touching the ground. And I thought, wow, yeah, some primeval forest with giant trees all connected, big limbs, and I could see that, you know. I was all wrong. All right, hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right video. Today I'm here with my friend Daryl Luck in Baxter, Tennessee to teach you guys all about bamboo. So Daryl here is an expert in bamboo. How long have you been growing bamboo? Uh, I don't know how to consider myself an expert, but I've done... <laughs> Compared to me. I, ha I, I have a stack of books about that tall that are all <laughs> bamboo, but I've read them all. Uh, but yeah, I've been doing it about uh, almost 20 years. When I first, I moved here 20 years ago, and after about two years here, I started adding bamboo plantings. And in fact, where we're standing right now, this blocks the, the road from being in view. When I first moved here, I could sit on the front porch and you'd see cars driving by, people waving at mm -hmm. you. Oh, I didn't really like that too much. So it's good for privacy. There's my solution, year round greenery. I love it. So yeah, there's just so many things that you can use bamboo for and that's why I wanted to visit Daryl because I want to plant bamboo at my property for food, from, for building supplies, to make biochar, to make uh, all sorts of different things. And um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be here with you. So thank you for letting me come on over. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I, I want more people to know about bamboo. Absolutely. So I guess tell us why did you, what interested you about bamboo in the beginning? Why did you get started with it? I, I it's from my childhood really. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a river near me. I had to walk about almost a mile from my house to get there, but there was a bamboo grove growing along the edge of the river. And I, I mean, I was eight years old or whatever. I'd go down there and just sit in that bamboo and even at that young age, you, you'll feel it if you get into a nice bamboo grove. It's a different feel. Yeah. There, there's an energy there that's real different. So, you know, uh, I've always been interested in it. And I have moved around a lot uh, in different places in Tennessee looking for the perfect place, which I now have found. Uh, <laughs> perfect for me. Um, but at every farm that I left behind, I also left a bamboo grove or two. So we're going to go through Daryl's property, show you a bunch of different varieties of bamboo, uh, gonna go over which varieties that you might want to grow <clears throat> for your homestead and um, Yeah, just get some good advice about it and you know how to manage it too. That's something I'm concerned about I don't want it to you know get out of control and you know things like that So that's the main thing that keeps people from growing bamboo, yeah. but you know, it's to me it, It's not that the bamboo is just so invasive mm -hmm. that it's a scary thing it's that Americans haven't bothered to learn about bamboo and how it, it grows very differently from all the plants we're used to. And I'll explain all that, but you know, it's, it's just a lack of understanding and, and familiarity with the bamboo that keeps people scared of it. In Japan, uh, a property that's for sale, if it has a bamboo grove on it, it's worth a lot more than one without. And so that's a bamboo culture, you know, for thousands of years, they've lived with bamboo and used it in all kinds of ways. And China's the same way. And, there's lots of places around the world that had a bamboo culture hmm. and, and they still have that. But we never really had that here. I mean, there is a native bamboo in America. There's maybe three types of it, mm -hmm. but it gets maybe 15 feet tall. Uh, and you can use it for one year as garden stakes and all that. And then it kind of falls apart. It's not a real good quality wood and the shoots aren't that big for eating, but this is what's so interesting to me because a lot of people, I've heard people say, well, why would you plant bamboo in Tennessee? It looks so out of place. And I said, out of place? Well, the only reason it looks out of place is because we cut all the bamboo groves down and turned it into farmland where we grow GMO soybeans now or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, okay, I mean, we got rid of it, okay? Right. I mean, I have some growing up in my woods, uh -huh. wild bamboo, you know, it's around, it's along the creeks here and stuff yeah. sometimes. River cane, they call it. Uh, but they used to... Okay, when I was a little kid, I read that when the settlers were first arriving in America and starting their inroads inland, mm -hmm. a squirrel could have run from the East Coast all the way to the Mississippi River without ever touching the ground. Wow. And I thought, wow, yeah, some primeval forest with giant trees all connected, big limbs, and I could see that, you know. I was all wrong. That's not what America, the eastern half of the United States, only 50% of the land had that kind of a forest going on. Hardwoods the other 50% were cane breaks, okay? Huge areas, especially along river bottoms and things where the cane had just taken over. There's nothing else growing out there and huge. 
okay? And so when the settlers would come in, well, that's the prime farmland, the river bottom land. Right. And the river cane was pretty easy to get rid of instead of cutting down giant trees, so they could turn it into a farm field pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And when they first arrived, they could just put their cows and pigs out there for the winter, and they had plenty to eat and yeah. protection from the elements and all that. So it worked out real good, but the, the thing was they were wiping out the cane breaks mm -hmm. as they progressed. And the cane breaks is where a bird called the Carolina parakeet lived and nested. That's the only place it would make nests. We wiped out so much of that habitat that that bird went extinct. Wow. And it was, you see pictures of it, look up Carolina parakeet. I mean, it's, it's probably the prettiest bird we had in America. Wow. It looked like a, a, a parrot, multicolored parrot or something. Wow. Beautiful bird. If, if you want to start some bamboo on your property, first of all, highly recommend you have some sizable property. You know, if you're in suburbia and you'd like to block the view of your neighbor's yard and put bamboo along the fence, you're creating a huge problem for yourself and for your neighbor because eventually it's going to spread over there and they might not like bamboo like you do. Maybe they want to have a garden there and you know now your roots are all getting, the rhizomes have spread over there. So that's not a good idea. Now you can grow bamboo in containers if you really, really want some bamboo, a, a big pot. Some of them grow quite well in pots. In fact, these two smaller varieties would be excellent in pots. So that's an option. Uh, if you want it in the ground, they do make a bamboo barrier out of a heavy duty plastic that limit because bamboo is a shallow rooted plant so you know the bamboo barrier goes down about 30 inches and it's very unlikely it's going to go underneath it might try to go over top but then you can see that easily and cut that rhizome so it doesn't spread so that's another method but this this is how a homestead can make maximum use of bamboo because the humans are going to use it the animals are going to use it you're going to you're going to find all kinds of uses for the canes and, and crafts and so forth so what i was saying is you Go out in the middle of a pasture, say, and maybe you want to have a bamboo grove that's a circle 30 feet across, okay? Well, you get your bamboo started and you can just put one plant in the center and in about five years, it'll start filling that all up and be bigger and everything. Um, and so you could put a fence around that so your livestock won't get at and damage them at all. But now, however tall your variety you've chosen is, let's say you've got something that gets 40 feet tall, well then, from the edge of your grove, 40 feet out, all the way around, there's gonna be rhizomes under that ground. And in the spring, they're gonna send up shoots. Well, that's your zone to harvest shoots to eat. Or just allow the animals that are in that pasture to come and eat them if you want, you know? Uh, so that'll limit it. The bamboo will never spread beyond that fence because it's being mowed or eaten or harvested for food. So, you know, that, that's the safest way and you don't have to worry about the bamboo getting out of hand or anything like that. Now, uh, if you have a flowing creek, that's a limiting barrier. You could have the bamboo up against the creek and, and then mow around the other three sides or whatever. Yeah, you could be up against the woods and you might get a few pop up at the edge of the woods, but they're not gonna do, they like full sun. If you're, you want bamboo to really thrive, put it, it needs full sun. Okay, and the shade will limit it. It might not you know, die off, but it's not gonna really go crazy or anything. So, you know, you got a few things you can use to limit it. Uh, I would advise, from my own experience, just don't plant bamboo right alongside a county road or something like that. Because what happens with me is in the winter, uh, and I have a lot, it's quite a bit of bamboo right along the road. In the winter, you get an ice storm, snowstorm, something It weighs down the bamboo, it bows it down. Now, if you can wait it out, when it all melts, the bamboo springs right back up. You know, there might be one or two you have to cut that didn't spring up. But... Uh, it's a hassle for, if it's laying across the county road and it's kind of frozen to the county road, you know, which just happened right here in front of my house. I make that happen here sometimes. <laughs> so that's a little bit of a hassle to deal with. But, you know, other than that, I, it's not a problem. And, you know, my bamboo is where I want it to be. And if it gets out of that a little bit, well, I just cut that or harvest that shoot or whatever. When the shoots are coming up, it's going to be April, May or June generally. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to eat them and you just want to, you know, keep, get them out of the way so they don't, you can just go by and kick a shoot down. I mean, that, that'll kill it. Yeah. And, you know, they're not going to come back until next year. They'll try again next year. There's a few varieties. One I have over here that it does, this time of year it'll send up some small things in addition to its spring shooting main season. Mm -hmm. But most bamboos, you got that, you got to be vigilant and, and see what's going on out there in April, May, and June and monitor it and collect your shoots or whatever you're going to do. And the rest of the year, there's nothing happening. So I've kind of, I've learned from having to manage some of my woods that 
you know, going into fall, winter, that's when I should kind of cut my hardwoods down and inoculate mushrooms, and that's that time of year. But then for bamboo, it's actually spring. That's when you're doing your management, I guess, of okay. or, or when, do you, when are you harvesting it? Well, yeah, if you're harvesting canes and all yeah. that, I, I like doing that in the wintertime. There's no okay. bugs, no snakes to worry about, uh, no nothing. Okay. Uh, it's pleasant weather, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, find a nice day, you're not freezing, you know, and, and get out there. Yeah, wintertime's Winter. good for cutting the canes. Okay. And you can stack them up and keep them in the dry and let them dry out good. And it, it's a, such a useful thing to have. I, I always, you know, it, I need something to fix a project or do something. My first thought is, could bamboo work yeah. for this? And almost always it does, you know? <laughs> That's neat. <laughs> Solved a lot of problems with bamboo. Yes. See, so yeah, I built a, my tomato trellis is, is made out of EMT this year, which is a wonderful uh, material. I love EMT. It lasts forever. It's galvanized steel, but it's really expensive now. I mean, it's twenty dollars a pole now wow. for a ten foot pole. I mean, it's so. This is a. This is why I want. One of the reasons I want to grow bamboo, because then it may not last forever, but it. Uh, I have an unlimited supply that I can always make another trellis out of for free. Yeah, and and you know some of the bigger timber bamboos and yeah. the, the ones that have a quality wood that they get. Uh, I mean, they'll last five or ten years wow. doing a job for you out in the weather. Wow. You know? So maybe that'd be kind of neat. Maybe use some of the, the thicker timber bamboo as the main post for yep. my trellis. Yep. And then use a more medium-sized ones for the top. Mm -hmm. And that would last for, you know, a decent amount of time. Absolutely. And that and that's another, brings up another thing. If, if you have a homestead and you're going to get into bamboo, mm -hmm. if you have the room, grow more than one species you know grow a big timber bamboo grow a medium size that has good taste in shoots maybe or that's why you're growing that one and grow a smaller slender one you know you when you do crafts or projects you, you kind of need all sizes at times you know now if you're just wanting to if you're wanting to build a bamboo house or bridge or something well then you just need all that timber bamboo that's pretty much all you're going to work with unless you add some little decorative smaller things okay. but it's better to have a few varieties to work with i like that so yeah so we need to narrow down what is that what are some of those golden timber, the golden edible, and the golden I mean, combination? Right. Uh, for me, um, my best tasting shoots, if I, if I was going to grow for them, is the, they call yellow groove, is a common name. Holistachys aurea, I guess. Uh, I'm, I forget these scientific names because I don't talk about it all the time. But yeah. When I planted all this bamboo here, I would, man, I had them all at the tip of my tongue. Uh, but that, that yellow groove is a good one for good tasting shoots. Not very good for quality of wood that would last outside a long time. Which makes sense because it, it'll be maybe more softer, more supple in the beginning as it comes Yeah, up. but I don't know if that, it's just... Are some harder bamboos, can those still be delicious? That oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, so like, you know, that's why I like hennin. Okay. Because it, I mean, it's not necessarily a best tasting. It doesn't have a bad taste, but, yeah. you know, I, I notice a little better taste with this one and one more I'll mention. But the hennin uh, is the timber bamboo, so you're going to get bigger shoots to eat. And you know you got the big canes to work with to build with and do whatever, so I like that one because that's you know multi-use. You can eat it. and and of course always remember that this stuff stays green year round. So if you have chickens, goats, sheep, cows, whatever, you can go out in the middle of the winter and cut them some fresh greenery and throw it in there. They I'm excited crazy. for that. That this could be a really big supplement for me for Absolutely. my for my sheep. Yeah, all my animals really. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes a big difference, and they they love it, and it's real good for them too. Right, there's so, a lot of mineral content in, in bamboo, and mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, yeah. And see, there's another thing, like if you, in the winter, yeah. maybe you're gonna harvest some big canes that you wanna dry and use on a project. Mm -hmm. Well, all the branches up top, you can carry in and throw yeah. to the what, livestock. Yeah. So, like you know, works out real good. All right, we're in my Hennon Grove right now. This is one of the timber bamboos that I was mentioning. Gives you really big shoots and excellent material to work with. This holds up really great outdoors for many, many years. So this is a good bamboo to have. These divisions are called nodes. The area in between is called the internode. Well, these internodes are what? I don't know, eight, 10 inches, something like that. We're gonna go see another bamboo later that's uh, called the flute maker's bamboo. And it, it doesn't get quite as big around as Hennon, but it, it gets pretty sizable. But they call it the flute maker's bamboo because it has, of all the bamboos we could grow around here, it has the longest internode and it's long enough to make a flute and have room for all the holes. And so, yeah, a lot, a lot of people buy that kind of bamboo. Rubro, it's Philostachys rubro marginata. Uh, they call it that because when the shoots come up, the shoots have little like leaf sheaths on to protect them. And along the edge of that sheath, it's, it's red. It's kind of neat looking, you know, uh, but rubro means red. So it's a red margin 
and that's why they gave it that name. So all the scientific names kind of refer to, you know, Aurea, Aurea sulcata is yellow groove, you know, it's in the sulcus, there's a yellow, yeah. And we just heard a truck go by, so this, this is real close, this is another one I have close to the road, and some are right at the edge of the road out there. I keep them back about three or four feet. I don't let them get past that. But some of these lean over in the winter time and uh, give me a little bit of a problem. It's not that big a deal. But I wanted to say, and this, this is the crux of the matter for people with bamboo in America, why, why they're so afraid of it, because they don't understand what I'm about to tell you is how bamboo grows. And once you have that knowledge, you have a lot more control over the bamboo even eliminating it totally if you want to. I had a, a fellow write to me and he, uh, he had a bamboo grove that was, or it was bamboo in his backyard and it was spreading to his neighbor's house and, but it was rocky and not a convenient place. He goes, you know, people were telling him, you're gonna have to bring bulldozers in to get all that out, you know? And it was being a problem for him because it spread to the neighbor's house. Well, I told him how he could totally eliminate that and it would take about three years, but no machinery, no nothing, just using your smarts. Okay, so, and I'll get into that in a second, but first I wanna tell you how this stuff grows. Okay, when you plant, say you order from a nursery, you're gonna get it, like you probably do. You're gonna order a Henan plant or two or whatever, and it might be four or five feet tall in a little three gallon pot or whatever. You plant that, within five years, you should start seeing canes come up about this size, but this is the difference. We're all used to, if you plant a tree, it's a little skinny sapling, and each year it gets bigger, and bigger and it builds upon that. Bamboo's not like that at all. What they say about bamboo is the first year it sleeps, mm -hmm. the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. Oh, like so in that third year it's going to really start taking over some territory. That's what it's trying to do. It'll send runners out and pop up over there somewhere. And so you got to watch it because you want it within where you want to keep it, you know. But um, what what's going on here is when I said after five years you start to see something like this. Well, during those five years, the rhizomes are building up and storing energy and becoming a stronger, they're all connected. All these bamboos here, they're all connected to each other underground. And that's an interesting thing. A lot of bamboos, when, when they flower, they do it all over the world at the same time because they're from the same mother. Okay, they're, same, they're all the same. So that's pretty interesting. But let's say it's five years now and you're gonna get canes this big. Well, it doesn't come up skinny and get big over the years. It comes up full size. And right out of the ground, this sh big fat shoot, if you want to eat it, it's excellent. If you let it keep growing, I mean, they grow more than a foot a day when they're sending these shoots up. And they will make this cane, it'll go all the way up to full height, whatever the bamboo does, 30 feet, 50 feet, whatever that variety does, you'll just see a, a, a solid cane going up there. And when it gets to full height, then it lays out branches. And then it puts on the leaves. And, and so that, right, what I just described, is the key to, if you buy a property and it has bamboo and it's gotten out of hand and you'd rather just get rid of it totally, okay, here's how you do it. You use that knowledge of how it grows against it. Okay, so let, let's say it's this time of year, it's September, and you want that bamboo totally gone. You don't want to leave any, you want it gone. Go out and cut down all the canes. That's your first job. Now, you got to be real observant and vigilant in the springtime. When they start sending, they're gonna, you know, just because you cut them down isn't gonna stop anything, okay? In the spring, they're gonna send shoots up. You wanna let them do that. Let them send the shoot up the whole way because it's drawing energy from the rhizome system to do that. That's a lot of energy to make something like that. And let it lay out the branches. That's some more energy getting sapped. But as soon as you see the first hint of a leaf coming on, cut everything down again. Well, that really sets it back, and it's not gonna like that, but it'll wait till late summer and it might send up some little small things, which you can do the same process with and get rid of them. And next year, here comes some more big canes. I mean, you might do this two, three years, four, I don't know, but you just keep with it. You are constantly weakening that rhizome system. You never let it get leaves out where it can draw energy, do photosynthesis and feed itself. And eventually they die and you will have no bamboo there. So no chemicals, no bulldozers. You don't, you know, that's not necessary. All right, we're, we're Back here where I have some black bamboo growing, uh, it had a die off in the winter. Sometimes it gets cold enough, it kills the top, but the roots survive and it comes back. So this is, this is still recovering from that. But the, thing, the cool thing about black bamboo, and it gets, like here's a black bamboo, it gets a lot 
bigger in diameter than this when it's, you know, a healthy grove is, you know, not recovering from a disaster. Uh, so it'd probably be at least an inch or inch and a quarter in diameter. Um, and when they first come up, a new cane will have some black and some green on it. But the older they get, they just turn pitch black. And the unique thing about black bamboo, well, one, it's a real pretty bamboo. Like if you have a pond or something, it likes to arch. And, and it just, it looks real pretty, you know, so people like it for that. But um, the, uh, the blackness never goes away. With all other bamboos, if they're green or yellow or green with a yellow stripe or whatever, that all disappears when you cut them and they dry out. They just turn that tan color you used to see in bamboo look like. But the black bamboo stays black. And uh, Japanese highly value this for fine furniture making. Uh, and it's a good quality wood. There's two kinds of bamboo. Clumping bamboo and running bamboo. Clumping bamboo just, when it adds, when it spreads, it's just right next to everything. It's just, it's a tight clump. And you know, if you go to South America somewhere where they have a whole giant forest of this, you can't even get in, you can't go in there. Yeah. Okay, in fact, there was a, I wish I knew the details of the story. I can't remember which explorer it was that went to, it was in Northern South America somewhere, you know, not Cortez, I, mean, I don't know, one of those guys. And, you know, ready to rape and pillage and find gold, you know, right, like they were doing back then. And he found this village that was a bamboo culture in South America in a bamboo jungle of, of, of the clumping bamboo. And the only way to the village was they had cleared a straight walkway that got you way back in there. And then they had opened it up and they had their village back there. It was the only way in and out. And it was well defended. So he had trouble attacking that place and was losing men. So, you know, they came up with a solution that, you know, just burned the whole place yeah. down. <laughs> now we got in there, see if they have any gold. Oh okay, goodness. so, you know, pretty horrible. Yeah. But anyway, the clumping bamboo is pretty amazing how it's so tight packed. The, the running bamboo doesn't get so densely packed usually, and, it, you know, it likes to spread out and travel and move to new places. And that's what causes a lot of people trouble if you're growing it in a city or something. If you're going to grow it in a city or suburbs, it should be in a pot, I think, and just appreciate what you can get that way. If you do want to do multiple, a few different varieties, is it better to spread them further? Absolutely. Like, remember what I said now, yeah. you got however tall your bamboo is, that's how far out it's going to send rhizomes. Okay. Well, you want to be, you know, skip a little space and put your next one in where if, if it's coming that direction, they're not going to meet or uh, going to be a lot of space in between. You can, so clearly keep them apart. And, and also I'll mention, you know, for Homestead, you know, it's a money-making thing. Yeah. I mean, you can sell, obviously you can sell crafts made out of bamboo. You could sell the bamboo shoots if you can get a market for that. But uh, you can sell young plants that come up. And bamboo is very pricey. If you go look up on a bamboo, just look up bamboo groves. Uh, like I said, I like Lewis Bamboo in Jasper, Alabama, the good folks, they'll UPS you whatever you want. Their website's very informative, teach you all about the different varieties. So, you know, you, you could have a little bamboo nursery very easily. Oh. And if you had separate varieties that you kept separate, so you knew that what you're selling was that variety, uh, you know, you grow them for, you have to, you can dig them up and the small, you know, when you see small ones coming up along the edge of the grove or something, or at late summer when sometimes they send up a little, boy, those are excellent, dig them up. And you pot them and you raise them in a pot for a full year. Okay, so that they are very well rooted. And then when you sell it, it's gonna survive. You know, if you just dig them up and sell them, you know, they might not make it. So, but you can make a lot of money selling bamboo. All right, here we are in between two, two big bamboo groves, a bigger bamboo. Goes up quite high and we are close to the road, but uh, just a nice little peaceful walk through here. And, uh, I did want to say one thing about um, if you're doing craft work or building with bamboo, uh, you need to know how it, it's structured. All the grain is exactly parallel. So, you know, you can take a machete on the end of it and split it into two halves and, and pull it. It splits perfectly down the middle. And then you can split that and split that. You can get, I mean, in Japan, they get down to microscopic and make these little tiny baskets. It's, they do amazing things with bamboo. But, um, if you're gonna build like you wanna uh, put a nail or a screw or something, you can't, you can't do like you can with a stick of wood. As soon as you drive a nail or a screw in there, it's gonna start splitting that bamboo. So all the holes have to be pre-drilled. Okay. So the, the screw or nail passes through the bamboo easily and then into whatever you're nailing it to. So, you know, that, that, that's a 
key thing to know if you're trying to work with it because it's different. I yeah. made that mistake. I just put a screw through it. Yep. And then it split. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> now you know what to do. Now, you know what to do. <laughs> I brought us down here now too. This is the uh, Philostachys rubra marginata, the flute maker's bamboo, and had a bit of a disaster here last winter. If you notice, a lot of these canes are not growing straight up, they're growing sideways <laughs> or tilted quite a bit. Well, what happened is we had a big ice and snowstorm and the wind blowing also from the north and it pushed all that bamboo off and weighted it down with ice and snow and, and then they couldn't, you know, they, they weren't able to rise back up. Usually bamboo will do that and then it just rises back up, but they're all laying on top of each other, weighting everybody down and it's all stuck there. And so I've got a big project ahead of me. I, I want to cut any bamboo that's not growing straight up and down is coming out. It's going to be a major scalping of this thing, but I got to get it back like it was. And uh, we'll take a closer look at this bamboo now, because this is the flute maker. I want to show you why they call it that. Come on, Pete, Pete. Okay, there's the bridge, oh, wow. which unfortunately I used gravel to fill in here. This is all gravel about that deep. Yeah. Uh, I used gravel from the creek, which had so much silt in it, it's growing stuff. <laughs> I mean, I should take it all off and use just get bring some limestone gravel in, and it would I wouldn't have to mow it ever or anything. But this thing's rock solid. This is going to be here forever. I started out with two big cedar trunks yeah, side by side, and I set them on the bank, but not on the soil. They're up on rocks. Oh. Okay, so they're they're in the and now they're in the dry because I've built all this on top. So what I did is the next thing on top of those two uh, trunks, I got a. Uh, see, this was 14 feet. I had a 14 foot wow. cattle gate, you know, the big stout, yes. you know, rounded metal, you know, okay. And I laid that across the two cedar logs. And then on top of that, I had a bunch of roofing, metal roofing just left over from a project. And so I, I started running it this way and that way. And there's probably five or six layers of roofing. And then I got all these rocks that go up right against the rib of the roofing so they can't be pushed out. And I filled in with gravel. And, and it's sort of, it's like a covered bridge because you know the, what's holding the bridge up is not out in the weather. It's protected from the rain, it's up off the ground, and it's cedar. So I think I'm gonna have a bridge here for a while. Yeah, at least 50 years. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it'll outlive me. This is uh, the flute maker's bamboo or Philostachys rubro marginata. Remember the other one, the Hendon was probably about that long. This is, a, this is the longest one you can get. And uh, it gets pretty, you can see it gets pretty sizable and has excellent tasting shoots. That was I was gonna say, oh. this one and the yellow groove are my two favorite for the shoots. Tell us about the Dolce and the Dolce, a Dolce. Yeah, there is one, uh, I guess it's just Philostachys Dolce. Uh, Dolce is Spanish for sweet. It has real sweet tasting shoots. Mm. Uh, you know, you can eat them without even cooking them. They're, they're just sweet. Uh, and I have some way up on the mountain, but a lot of the ones I've planted out in the woods that started out with a nice light opening, mm -hmm. the trees around them are just so tall, they still weren't getting what they need. And so a lot of them are alive and putting up a few shoots, but it's not thriving like the ones I have in the full sun. This has good taste in shoots and good wood. And pretty good, okay. Yeah, whereas the yellow groove, the wood's not that great. Okay. Really not. And if I haven't mentioned it, uh, when a cane comes up, if you're going to use it for wood, you want to have it be three or four years old, okay? It takes at least three years for that wood to really harden up and be what you want. And then after four years, it starts to go downhill a little bit. So three to four year old bamboo is prime time. How do you know it's three or four years old? Well, uh, is there any way or the, just have to pay attention? Well, you could just pay attention, but you know, you could tell maybe by looking at the quality of the cane, you know, like, like this one looks like it's more weathered. You know, I would guess that that's probably okay to use for wood better than this one, which I think came up this year. It's real bright green and everything. But I know the Japanese, when they manage a grove, uh, they, they keep the bamboo cut so that they can walk its shoulder width where they can walk through without, you know, squeezing or anything. And what they do in the spring, when all the shoots first come up, they go out there and they scratch in the bamboo and they write the date, or at least the year that that came up. So then they, they can know when three or four years old stuff is there. You'll still be able to see those marks. So that's a good way. A lot of people who kind of fear bamboo or don't like that 
people were planting invasive species in our country and that kind of thing. Well, you know, like I said, I mean, they have an invasive characteristic to them, but they're, they're only dangerously invasive if you don't pay attention to them and you don't work with them. So, you know, that, that's how, how we need to be more with the bamboo. But people think, they'll say things like, well, it's gonna take over habitat and replace our natural environment and it's gonna mess up the woods and all that. Well, first of all, you gotta realize we're nowhere near some pristine thing that needs to be preserved exactly as it is. This is the dregs, of, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's the dregs of what's left over from a lot of destruction. Okay, we've, we've clear cut forests and, you know, turned fields into parking lots and just, I mean, we've changed so much. So it's, I'm not saying any of this deserves to be destroyed and bamboo's not gonna destroy it. I mean, think of China or Japan. They have huge bamboo groves and they maintain them and they use the bamboo and it's a valued thing, but they also have regular hardwood forests. It's not like they lost all their forests because they had bamboo. It, it doesn't work that way. And you know, once you know more about bamboo and people are making use of it, well, it's not gonna spread as much because you're, in, you're paying attention and, and you're, you're waiting for those shoots so you can eat them or so forth. So, you know, that's just something I wanted to mention. It's not, there's, we're not needing to preserve things exactly as they are. And that's always true, whether you're talking about bamboo or anything. I mean, there's, there's national parks and forests we have that they're trying to cut away certain species that have come in so, so that that forest will be like it was in 1894. Well, that was 1894. The world's changing all the time. Nature's always changing. And, you know, and I think that given enough time, all the bamboo around the world would fill in any niche that suited it temperature and climate wise. We're just facilitating that happen faster because people were moving the bamboo around the world. But I think it would end up there eventually on its own somehow over time. If more people but, were knowledgeable about bamboo and yeah. all the great uses it has, then it would be like in, in some Asian countries where really bamboo probably has a hard time spreading because people are always up there cutting it down and yeah, taking yeah. the shoots and yeah. making use of it, you know, so it can't spread. It's just, if you ignore it, you know, then you just, you know, seeded down something that's, who knows what it's gonna do. But just remember, it's not gonna spread into the forest much at all because it's shaded. Shade. Yeah, that was good yeah. for me to know because I want to build, I have an idea about making a fun little trail into my hardwoods and then inside of the hardwoods is a little, you know, some nice chairs and a little mm -hmm. place to rest and, you know, a peaceful area. I can't remember the name of this grove. It's in North Georgia that I visited yeah. and it's been there for 50 years. The guy, he planted a whole bunch of different kinds. Mm -hmm. He has roads cut through there and all. And uh, it's it's like, it, it was, you walk in there, it's, it's so dark. I was there at 12 noon and it was so dark. You really sort of needed a flashlight. It's that dense, wow. you know? And, but why did I mention his, it was, oh, and he had a place where uh, the bamboo was at the edge of the woods, okay, so he had a big grove out here, but some of it had spread, you know, I, you know 50 feet, 100 feet up there, I, you might see one cane mm -hmm. just here and there, but to me, it's like, yeah, it's getting along fine with the forest, yeah. not hurting anything, right. you know, it looked kind of cool. Oh, I wanted to ask you about my question, propagation, like, let's say I wanted to, you know, take some bamboo from you or from a friend's place, when do you dig it up? And then how do you get it to successfully transplant in your plot? You can dig bamboo or transplant it any time of the year when the ground's not frozen, mm, okay. okay? But I would say a better time would be early spring, okay. maybe, or this time of year where it has a few months before the hard freeze comes to get established. You know, those might be the best. I wouldn't plant it right at the beginning of the hot summer unless you're gonna be out there watering it a lot because that first year you might have to keep it watered and take care of it. But after that, there's no care needed for the bamboo. It, it, it's drought tolerant and grows in just about any kind of soil. And you know, it's great if you have an erosion problem, you know, bamboo is excellent with that system of rhizomes. That'll hold the soil so good. And it doesn't have to be a real tall bamboo. It could be some of those short ones I was showing you down there. And it, it's just holding your soil down and looks beautiful. I like that for erosion control. That's a really smart idea. Mm -hmm. I really like that. So then another, uh, what about putting them in a pot? That's another thing you could do, right? Yeah. Dig them up, put them in a pot. You could have them in there for a year if you want. I think you were kind of mentioning that for- Oh, yeah, to, for, for you want to grow the roots. So the roots are really good when you yeah. sell it to someone, it'll actually take root and go. If you plant it in a pot, <laughs> make sure it's not a pot that comes up and goes in a little like that. You know, okay. I've seen, because if you ever want to get the bamboo roots and soil out of that pot, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a tough time. 
So you want a pot that's like this shape. Okay. So you can pull that whole plug out easily. Uh, I understand. Okay, because yeah. the roots are going to go around and, and they're, they're thick and hard and they don't decompose very quickly. I've got a pot over here. I've been hoping things would decompose in there the past two years, but I don't know when I'm going to be able to get that soil out. But, you know, I could get in there with a ciprosol and cut roots and really fight it, I guess, but it's okay. I'll let nature do it. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure people are going to learn about bamboo. That was my main purpose to talk here today. Uh, and I have, there's a lot of books about bamboo, fascinating topic, but I have two here that I think people would find especially interesting if you want to learn more about bamboo. The first one is if you're serious about buying bamboo and planting it on your property and you're trying to figure out what variety do I want, you know, what, what uses does it have, how big does it get, how cold can it take in the winter. Uh, this book right here, Bamboo for Gardeners, Ted Jordan Meredith. Uh, I, I really value, I've, this is one of my most valuable bamboo books. I love this thing. And he gives so much detail about each species and you, you really learn a lot about the different bamboos and mm -hmm. how they grow and all. It's everything you need to know in here. This is really a, a great book. Okay. If you're maybe not going to raise bamboo, but you like the idea or you're fascinated by bamboo, you think it's an interesting thing, then I would highly recommend this book for anybody. It's, it's, the, it's the Book of Bamboo, it's called, by David Forelli. Um, history. It, it's a lot of the history of bamboo around the world, how bamboo cultures have come up and gone. And uh, it's also information about how bamboo grows and, and information about different species. But most, to me, the most fascinating thing was the, the history and all. And I'll tell you one little teaser to get you, get you in on it, because uh, it blew me away when I read it. Back in China, back, I think it was in the 1800s sometime, they had a situation where there were roving bands of banditos stealing from people and, you know, taking all their farm uh, animals or, you know, whatever. And so there was a place in bamboo in, in, in China where there was a really big lake. And so all these people got together and they started building bamboo rafts out of, out of big bamboo. You know, they made platforms that float in the lake. And then on top of those, they'd build a house. They'd build raised garden beds and bring soil and put it there, mm. which could reach down into the lake with the roots. <laughs> and so they didn't have to water their garden beds. They had fruit trees growing in the same way. They had farm animals out there. They became a whole town, a bamboo town, where the buildings and the platform, and they had holes cut where you could fish. You could just sit right there in your, in your house, I guess, and go fishing oh if you cut a hole in the floor. And, and so, they all, so they had a whole bunch of people living together, growing their food and animals, and they were protected. They were far away from the shore. Mm. And if anybody tried to come, well, there's a lot of people there to see them coming and, right. and, and mount a defense. Yeah. So I, I thought that was just a really cool oh, thing. That is really cool. Yeah, so lots of neat things like that in that book. And mm. I'll leave you with the last thing. I want to read this to you. This is about the nutritional value of bamboo shoots, if you're going to eat them or your animals are going to eat them. All right, it says pickled, dried, frozen or fresh. Bamboo shoots are a low calorie source of potassium and protein. Also contains magnesium, germanium, both said to have anti-cancer and anti-aging functions. Young shoots are rich in nutrient components, mainly proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, and fiber, and are low in fat and sugar. They're, they are a good source of thiamine, niacin, vitamins A, B6, and E. Potassium, calcium, manganese, zinc, copper, iron, and chromium, and contains 17 different amino acids, eight of which are essential for human health. Another component in bamboo shoots is phytosterols, phytonutrients, phytonutrients that are similar to cholesterol, yet have been shown to inhibit the absorption of cholesterol in its intestinal tract, in the intestinal tract, and help lower bad LDL, low density lipoproteins, mm. cholesterol. Hmm. So, a healthy food to eat. Yeah. So this is Daryl's spring-fed pond. <laughs> and this is one of the gourds that he, he grew. Yeah. He used to grow and sell gourds? Yeah, and the decorate them and make things out of them. Yeah. yeah. This is this is an old gourd. This is probably thirty years old. It's so fun. Thank you. <laughs> oh man, that's so good. I just taste the minerals. Food.
That was pretty fun to get to drink this area.